Hi everyone, let's run through the answers to last week's topic, which was Occupiers Liability Acts 1957 and 1984. So to begin with, this was an example on that we looked at in respect of George's parents being away for a weekend. So she invites some friends around for a pool party. She's aware of this diving board, uh, that it's broken, but nonetheless watches as her friend Danny jumps from it and then uh, inevitably injures himself. So we did go through the answer to this one, just to recap. So there is a possible claim under the Occupiers Liability Act 1957. Firstly, we start with, is Georgia an occupier? She is clearly in control of the premises, which is the house. Uh, Danny is a lawful visitor. He was invited to the party, so that's why this 1957 Act applies, not the 1984. And then it's a question of, has Georgia breached her duty of care, or her common duty of humanity to keep him reasonably safe? And clearly, because she's aware of the danger of that uh, diving board, the answer here has to be yes, she said nothing, and so he does have a claim. Likewise, I think we did also look at this one, which was Rebecca uh, at college, walking near this water cooler. She slips on this large pool of water and injures her back. Is there a possible claim under the 1957 Act here? And the answer is uh, yes. The uh, college management are the occupiers. The premises is the building that it takes place in, wh wherever that might be. Could be the um, outside the sports hall. I don't know. She is a lawful visitor because, of course, she has license to be on the premises as a college student. And it then comes back to the question of is there a breach here? And no sign has been put out. If the college management uh, or employees had placed a sign out to say something like caution water or or i would have thought you know cleared it up then there may have been certainly a defense of some description but here as they did nothing uh and didn't keep her reasonably safe rebecca has a claim now these are the ones of which i didn't provide the answers before in my presentation so uh i want you please to look at the answers that you did okay pause the video if you need to at any point and let me just run through with you these and and see if you've got them correct as well so bradley goes to a gig to see his favorite band some rigging from the ceiling which had been installed by an independent contractor comes loose and injures him does bradley have a claim under the 1957 act so i've said possibly uh here if we look again you've got here uh the occupier being the uh, the sort of the owner, if you will, of the um, the venue, um, and then the premises themselves are the venue. Now there is a possible defence here for the owner of the venue under section two, subsection four, and this is where you're arguing that an independent contractor or third party has been negligent in the work that they've done, and it's because of them that the uh, injured party here, which is Bradley, you know, that's what's caused his injuries. So we've got three tests here to establish and all three must be met. Firstly, it was reasonable for the occupier to have given the work to a specialist. Now clearly here, uh, rigging that needs to be put in place for uh, a concert of some description, that naturally has to be um, put out to a third party, a specialist. So the answer there is yes. Secondly, the contractor hired somebody who was competent, qualified. Now, someone that was competent in a sense was, and we don't have too much information here, but the questions you would raise in the exam answer is, someone who's competent would be qualified. Do they have insurance? Uh, as I said before, you go onto some websites and people are, are sort of endorsed or rated. So again, all these things can help in evidence make a decision in terms of that one. And then thirdly and finally, the occupier must check the work was completed properly. Now, the more technical the work, clearly there may be need for another third party, uh, a specialist to look at it. So here, I would say given the extent of the work and how technical it was, I think that a second uh, opinion, if you will, was needed, someone to check that work, someone who had knowledge. So what I would say here is, Depending if all three uh, parts of this test are met, then the owner of the venue 
may not have any claim against them by Bradley. Okay, it would revert to um, that uh, contractor. However, if we could say that the venue owner, you know, should have got somebody to check that work and didn't, in other words, cut corners, try to save money, that kind of thing, then the claim that Bradley makes against the venue owner, venue owner is going to be quite a considerable one and I think may succeed. Then we've got in this scenario, Lauren pays Charlie, an electrical contractor, to replace the faulty electric wiring in her house. As Charlie is stapling some cables along a skirting board, he severely grazes his hand on a rusty nail and later develops blood poisoning. Now, again, possible claim, I think, here for... Uh, we're talking about Charlie, who's injured himself, under the 1957 Act. Uh, but... Lauren may, again, have a defence here. So what we're really talking about here, and it's, it's laid out, as I've put here, under section 2, subsection 3, subsection B, is that if you have a tradesperson, such as here, an electrical contractor, that they should guard against risks that they would expect to find in their job. And again, I would say, you know, reasonable risks that they would expect to find. And so here... We could argue that, you know, Charlie doesn't seem to do that, does he? Um, I think what he's doing certainly is risky. And there may be a defence here, as I say, for, for Lauren. Um, should he be aware of it? It's a question you can debate. Was Lauren even aware of the nail? Now, of course, it may bring a different perspective. If Lauren was aware of this nail or whatever it might be, and said nothing and let him go at it. I guess unless it was an obvious danger, and remember there's no need for a, a warning of any description if the danger is obvious, then that would obviously be on Charlie. But if it's not obvious and she knew about it and said nothing, that would change the context of this. But as it stands, uh, without going into hopefully too much detail, um, there's a debate to be had here of he should have realised there would be these risks involved and he didn't and she's therefore maybe got a good defence. Just to say before I move on, with this topic, because we're dealing with Acts of Parliament, unlike some other topics which have been largely sort of common law based, then this is a mixture of section numbers and cases and clearly the most important thing for this topic is that you do need to know your section numbers. Not all of them, I flagged them up in my last video, the ones that you do need to know, but you would be expected, certainly if you're looking to achieve a high grade, to know section two, subsection th uh, three, subsection B. Uh, if you do naturally forget any of these in the exam, then you can just explain them. But again, if you're looking for a high grade, then you're really uh, expected to do both. Okay, next one. Trisha, who is six years old, so now we're dealing with a child, so remember all those things that we said here. Now, she's on holiday with her parents. While staying in the hotel in a room on the second floor, she wanders onto the balcony when her parents aren't looking and falls through the railings due to her small size. Trisha breaks her leg in the fall. Is there a claim here? Again, I'm not sitting on the fence, but possibly. Possibly because there are a few things you need to consider. Again, if we're talking about um, Occupy, it would be the owner of the hotel, the venue is the hotel itself, or indeed the room. Um, but what we have here is, under Section 2, Subsection 3, the defendant must be prepared for children to be less careful than adults. So I'm talking here about the hotel owners. They have to be prepared that children are more uh, allured. I think we talked about allurement. There's an allurement to risk there. They're attracted by it. So it's about securing the premises in terms of offering reasonable protection for a child of that age. Now, you could argue, I suppose, that if you were having, um, where was this, a balcony and the railings, if the railings have, you know, quite big gaps in them, then clearly that is something that is a risk that the hotel should have done something about. But um, I would say that there is a sort of possible defence here again, because 
the owner of the hotel, the occupier, doesn't remember have to eliminate all risk. It's about reasonable protection. And clearly, if a parent or guardian should have been supervising the child, so let's say that the, you know, the, her parents are in the room doing something, and Trish has wandered off. She goes out onto the balcony from the open sort of uh, door, and then she's playing around, and then she falls. There's a strong argument there, isn't there, that really the fault lies with the parents, however harsh that may seem. So there may be no liability if that could be proven by the um, hotel owners. Okay, uh, excuse me. We've now got Robert. Robert inherits a large house from his deceased great-aunt Elvira. Um, on inspection, he realises the house is in disrepair and that there are loose floorboards. While away, a man breaks into the house and breaks their ankle on a floorboard that collapses. No claim under the Occupier's Liability Act 1957. This is really just uh, there to get you to be able to analyse a scenario and establish when a 1957 Act applies, which remember is to lawful visitors only, compared to the 1984 Act, which is unlawful visitors, you know, i.e. trespasses. Clearly, uh, Pete here is not a lawful visitor, so this Act wouldn't apply, and instead you would be talking about the requirements under the 1984 Act instead. So now, it's quite a nice transition into that. Let's deal with the 1984 claims. So again, I believe I went through the first two, but I'll do this as a recap. Roger, a burglar, breaks into Mustafa's property by smashing his living room window to break into his house. While taking his flat screen television off the wall, he steps in the children's toy car and falls on his back, uh, spraining it. The television then falls onto the burglar and breaks his nose. So I've put here no claim under the Occupier's Liability Act 1984. So again, you would start with who's the occupier. We have that as Mustafa. The, um, he's in control of the premises at the time, the premises being the house. So we're following that similar pattern. But then it's when we reach the duty of care that it's slightly different. Now, we know that Roger is an unlawful visitor. So you would think certainly this 1984 act would be the only thing that he would have to be able to bring a claim for. But he, Mustafa, does not owe Roger a duty of care because he had no reasonable grounds to believe a danger exists, nor would anybody have come uh, within the vicinity of it, you know, near to it. Frankly, a burglar, there's no way he, he would have known that that would have happened. And so rightly and fairly, in the eyes of justice, there would be no successful claim here. Um, by Roger the burglar. And then we looked at Ben, he owned a long garden uh, at the bottom of which was a derelict garage. So, you know, it's no one's in it, it's in disrepair. Having seen young boys trying to get over his garden fence near to the garage, Ben placed a large notice on the fence which stated, danger, keep out. Later, for a bit of fun, Alan, another young boy, climbed over the fence and onto the garage roof. The roof suddenly collapsed due to its rotten condition, because remember it was derelict, causing Alan to fall and rip his, sorry for the typo, rip his legs open on jagged tiles. Is there a claim here? Possibly. Um, again, moving past, you know, occupier, clearly that's Ben, premises, we're talking about the, um, well, we're talking about the garden, but remember it can be any fixed uh, sort of structure on it such as a garage. Now the difference here compared to the last is that Ben had reasonable grounds to believe a danger exists with this garage. Uh, furthermore, he knew, he was aware of the fact that young boys had been um, climbing into his garden and, and going into the garage. So that's the key difference. To avoid liability, Ben would have had to, for example, have provided a warning sign uh, however, you know, it, it does depend its effectiveness on the age of the individuals who are injured. Uh, so the member, the younger the child, perhaps the, uh, they're less able to understand and appreciate that, that risk. Um, if they're in the, for example, early teens, then we're talking that they're more able to appreciate the risk. 
irrespective of that, young people we know uh, are attracted to danger. So this is one for you to debate in your answer. Uh, you could say, as I said, the older they are, um, do they appreciate the risk? Maybe you could say um, if they appreciated the risk, there should be no claim by Ben. Uh, sorry, by um, Alan. That's right, by Alan. Uh, but it's one, again, you can debate. OK, next one. Vin is out celebrating with friends at his local pub in Brighton. A little worse for wear as they head home at midnight. They decide to go diving into the sea from a nearby harbour owned by Vikram, a wealthy businessman. It is a well-known spot where people jump into the sea. There are no warning signs, but security guards on patrol have escorted people away. Vin jumps into the sea and breaks his neck on an underwater obstruction. I've put here no claim under the 84 Act because it is an obvious danger. And so what we have here is, if you remember, there is no legal requirement on Vikram to actually uh, put up a, a warning sign for an obvious danger. Also, you could consider the factor of, as we did before, uh, time and, you know, the, the time of the day. Uh, I think, as I said here, this takes place at night time, sort of midnight. So it wouldn't be reasonable, the argument could be, that given that time of day, that Vikram would have been aware of anybody using that as a spot to jump off of, uh, if you see what I mean, that, that such activity would take place. Had he been aware of it, then again, that would be different. But as this seems to be the first time it's happened, and no reasonable person would have expected anyone to, to do such a stupid thing, frankly, at, at that place at that time, because at midnight, you know, you look down at the sea, you can't see a thing, okay? Then there, there really shouldn't be a claim. Okay, next one. Paul, a window cleaner, cleans Dorothy's windows, usually every three weeks. When Paul arrives one week, he knocks on her door but finds that she's out. He cleans the front windows and then, in order to do the back of the house, climbs over her back garden fence. While there, he trips over a plant pot and hits his head on the patio, causing slight bleeding. Now, I've put no claim here under the Occupier's Liability Act of 84. Again, we know Dorothy's the occupier, we know the premises of the house, or, or in fact here I think uh, it would be sort of the garden. Now he is, Paul, a lawful visitor up to a point, and I think the point at which he has no permission, at least on face value, okay, is when he um, climbs over a back garden fence. So he has no permission to do that. We have no evidence that she... Um, is inviting him to do that and so when he actually does trip over this plant pot I think that again there's no reasonable grounds to believe that a danger exists there um, and that she would have known that he would have done such a thing I mean furthermore as well I think that you could argue that um, like we did before about guarding against risk and so forth he is a tradesperson surely he should be aware of such dangers um, are they obvious dangers? So again, there's scope for maybe looking at other defences. But ultimately, I think that Dorothy has no duty of care because, frankly, she just wouldn't have been aware. There are no reasonable grounds for her to believe that there is a danger. Uh, next one. Amara's home has been plagued by break-ins and burglaries. She decides to um, out... I think I mean put... Apologies. She decides to put anti-climb spikes on the fence of her back garden where the burglars have been climbing over. She puts a sign up on the wall on the other side that says, Caution, danger of injury from spikes on the fence. One night later in the week, a burglar attempts to climb the wall but slips and impales his arm. Now, much like a similar one when we looked at a burglar before, um, we'll just skip straight to the, the, the key bit. No claim, I think, under the 84 Act. She, again, has no reasonable grounds to believe a danger exists, that somebody would be in the vicinity of it. That really fits the bill of a burglar. Um, she also has a complete defence in that she's put up this effective warning sign. Now, warning signs 
is a full defense to the 57 Act as well as the 84. But with the 84 Act, because we're dealing with trespassers, unlawful visitors, the standard that they have to be at is a lot less. So here, the fact that she has put out a warning sign is really enough. And um, if it seems like an obvious danger again, then the really the, there wasn't even any need for her to, to put a sign up. So the person in this case, which is, uh, well, the burglar, has assumed the risk by doing what they've done, and therefore it's on them. Matt inherits a large house from his deceased great-aunt Elvira. When Matt inspects it, he finds it in disrepair. The hall staircase leading to the first floor has loose floorboards. Matt is told that local teenagers use the house to meet up and make out. Matt leaves the property. Later in the week, a teenager who trespasses into the house falls through the staircase and breaks their leg. So here I've put possible claim under the 1984 Act. Uh, again, uh, we would do Occupy and Premises. That may seem pretty straightforward by now. But we're talking about the Occupy Matt. Um, he has reasonable grounds to believe a danger exists because here he's aware of the state of the house being in disrepair. He's also aware that teenagers from the local area have been um, trespassing into the property frequently. And frankly, he's not done anything about it. So he could have put up a warning sign, you know, no entry. This house is, um, y you know, not safe, whatever you want your sign to be. The danger is not obvious as um, the teenager who's going up the stairs. Uh, he, it would not be obvious to him or her that the floorboards are rotten and, and therefore they could fall through and, and very much be injured. And remember, of course, young people, that concept of allurement, young people are attracted to risk. The law wants to protect young people, even uh, trespassers uh, where it should apply. And so here, I, you know, I think that he is liable, Matt, uh, for the injury that's happened to the teenagers. Anyway, that's the end of uh, the presentation and also the answers. If you have any questions, please feel free uh, to email me them or put them in the comments below. Thanks very much, everyone. Stay safe.